As most of you already know, Tasha's call run of everything changes to every Gishis and Sword Mages to favorite cantrips have been at the forefront of discussions and controversy for over half a year at this point. By rules as written, these changes nerfed or even completely invalidated a few very popular combos, same ones that I've been using for character builds on this channel. Before we begin this dive into the intricate and often confusing mechanics of 5th edition, make sure you cast Booming Blade on the like button as well as green flame blade on its minions the subscribe button and bell icon we are all in an eternal combat encounter with the youtube algorithm so if you want to succeed on perception checks to notice all of my future videos you gotta deal some damage first and make them bleed now the first thing we should all be aware of is the reason behind the change the old versions of these two cantrips that we all loved and used could have been in theory cast with nothing but a component pouch or a spell casting focus as the component pouch or a spellcasting focus itself could have been used as an improvised weapon. This was a perfectly legal and within the rules for material spell components and improvised weapons, primarily because the material component didn't have cost attached to it. Of course, this wasn't the intended use of the spell. Now, besides arcane or druidic staffs being used as quarter staffs and therefore being used to cast the skag cantrips, to my knowledge, this is also not how these cantrips have been getting used prior to these changes. Personally, I think it's silly not to allow arcane or druidic staffs as quarter staffs. Just look at how Papa Gandalf smashes orcs with his. But um, you tell me, when have you ever heard of anyone casting booming or green flame blade with a component pouch or a wand? I certainly haven't, but maybe I just don't play with those kinds of people. So, why the change? Apparently Jeremy Crawford and the rest of the 5th edition rules designers saw this loophole as a problem big enough to warrant modifications to the wording, material components and range of these two cantrips. Despite Jeremy stating his tweets don't have the same weight as actual rules, we have nothing and nobody better to clarify these issues to us. In one of his tweets addressing these skag cantrip changes, one of the replies summarized my own feelings almost perfectly, most notably the fixing something that ain't broken part. Now even Jeremy himself said he'd allow the shadow blade combination at his table, so the only possible explanation for these changes is the initial substandard implementation of blade cantrips within the core 5th edition rule set. In other the words the intended use of these two cantrips is with actual weapons, not with component pouches or crystal orbs or rods or wands, so Wizards of the Coast designers decided to modify these spells to better fit the system according to this intent. Sadly, the spells were already largely being used in the intended way and, as most of us would agree, the fixes introduced more problems than there were before, otherwise it wouldn't have caused and continued to cause as much controversy. Now to have a really good understanding of how these changes interact with the core game and the reasons behind my own stance and opinions, it would be very prudent for you to pause this video, open page 202 of player's handbook and carefully reread everything until page 205. Done? Good. So, if you're grinding through Adventurers League, for example, they seem to have made up their minds already and sadly you're kind of out of luck there. Uh, a lot of stuff simply doesn't work anymore because they decided to stick to very basic rules as written rulings and completely ignore rules as intended interpretations. Now, in one of his recent videos about Shadowblade and Bladesinger, Trent Monk, a widely known D&D character optimizer, already addressed most of what I'm going going to reiterate here. Link to his video will be in the description, so remind me in the comments below if I do forget to link it, which probably will happen. If you're in some home game, but your DM is still adamantly sticking to rules as written, I suggest you go lay out the following arguments on top of the Jeremy's whimsical tweets we've all already seen. There's already sufficient evidence and reason to assign some kind of monetary value to every spell effect in the game, be it derived from the value of 
of the spell scrolls or the value of the spell casting services or even something else it is in my opinion very reasonable to assign a value greater than one silver piece to a shadow blade spell to allow it to work with booming blade and green flame blade banning these combos would make so many eldritch knights and blaine singers out there be way less cool and in my opinion that would be just a great injustice now what about a warcaster feat another very popular combo with booming blade well here's another tweet by jeremy where he explains the somewhat confusing differences between the spells with a range of self and then the spells with a range of self parentheses like five foot cone five foot radius whatever put simply you're the origin of these cantrips effects of the booming blade and green flame blade effects you're not the target of green flame blade and booming blade that's kind of what everybody intuitively understands right the targets of those spells are those that get attacked and hopefully take damage therefore it still works with warcaster feet rules as written this is also in line with the core fifth edition spellcasting rules about range targets and areas of effects so while this change doesn't invalidate the combo many people don't differentiate between the range and uh, targets and areas of effects rules so since you've already refreshed your memory of the core fifth edition spellcasting rules you no longer have such problems right right now here's where it gets tricky sorcerers twinned and distance spell metamagics in a purely logical rules as written sense the range of self is definitely not identical to the range of self and then parentheses a five foot radius the pure self spells can only target you there's no other way that they can target anybody else because the range is self so that means the only target possible is you but self and then parentheses and something in those parentheses may or may not target you and one or more other targets in the area of effects which is defined by whatever is written in the parentheses however the core rule for range specifically states spells that create cones or line of effect that originate from you also have a range of self indicating that the origin point of the spells effects must be you blah 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 but are the skag cantrips cones lines of effect i mean clearly not but the fact remains their range is no longer just five feet like it was before it sports that pesky self now even though you're clearly not the target merely an origin point so by rules as written distant and twinned definitely no longer work but is it really how it should be is this change to the range of these two spells unintentionally invalidating a combo that was never meant to be invalidated i can tell you one thing as a dm myself i've never had a sorcerer melee gishes giving me nearly as much trouble as bards and wizards spamming wall of force as soon as they hit level 9 or 10 so i'm letting both distant and twin metamagics work with the skag cantrips in my games these two combos were very situational and niche to begin with and i simply see no reason to introduce further restrictions just because someone somewhere decided to mix up some words and make modifications that introduced system-wide complications and conflicts i'm also going to continue making characters according to this interpretation so whenever someone makes a comment arguing about it you can bet i'm simply going to point them to this video last but not least what about natural melee weapons such as minotaur's horns dampier's vampiric bite feet weapons such as dragon hide retractable claws or even subclass feature weapons such as armor artificers thunder gauntlets by rules as written the lack of cost associated with these weapons would invalidate their use with these cantrips however there's basically no mechanical and mathematical difference between say a minotaur goring full with his horns and a human swinging a scimitar both deal 1d6 plus ability modifier damage so why should one be banned with booming blade and another one allowed with booming blade also the fact that these two cantrips are present on the artificer list of spells means the designers wanted and intended people to use green flame blade and booming blade with the artificer class so what possible sane reason would anyone have to restrict their use with the armorers thunder gauntlets especially since they deal the same same damage type as booming blade i mean it's even a thematical choice it's no longer just
just a mechanical choice, it's completely thematic. Here, I would simply follow the rules as fun doctrine. No more rules as written, 12 with what's written, 12 with what's intended. At the end of the day, if you want to try out an interesting and fun character concept that doesn't even go out of bounds of what every other character can do anyway, why would I have any reason to ban it simply because a few words on its features, spells and traits and whatever don't really agree fully with each other. Now, these are some of the most common Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade combinations that do and will come up often during your sessions. There are more, but they are like very situational and I don't think they will happen very often, so I don't think there's any reason to talk about them. You are free to leave your thoughts down in the comments, I'm sure there's gonna be many, many more exceptional examples. So until Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, they were part of the game, they were used by many players and few people really had any problem with them. There are worse things than damage, believe it or not, and DMs know this, which is why they rarely, if ever, ban those combos in their games. I'll say it again, as a DM myself, I'm way more worried about a level 9 wizard spamming wall of force in every fight than a sorcerer sword mage rolling a bunch of d8s with his shadow blade plus quick and booming blade combo. As much as we all like seeing hundreds of damages rolled, me personally as well, no amount of damage can come close to how some of the widely used spells can break the game. But since we've got what we've got now, if you want to play a character that looks to utilize these mechanics, you will have to speak with your DM beforehand to know what you can and cannot do. As you can probably tell, I'm not a fan of these needless changes, in my opinion, simply because a lot of the established mechanical combos that weren't even a problem in the first place are now under a serious question. Take, for example, rope trick spell as like a counter argument, right? Same situation, a spell with a material component that doesn't have a cost associated with it, so you can make an argument, well, what if I just cast this spell with the component pouch, but everybody understands that in order for the casting of that spell to succeed, you need a rope of a certain length because the spell description itself says so. You can cast with the component pouch, with the spell casting focus, whatever, but you still need a rope because the spell description is very very like exclusive in that regard. Imagine if something like this was done to Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade. Imagine if the only change to those two cantrips would have been something like additional of a simple or martial melee weapon in that first sentence of their spell descriptions. But um, that's kind of like slowly turning into a topic for another video, a rant video, maybe sometime in the future. So until then, the video script text file for this video is available for download on my Patreon page under the Fireball tier. It's not mandatory, it's 100% optional, especially in these troubled, globally challenging economic times. But if you do find the Patreon perks worth the trouble, worth your time and worth your money, consider supporting my efforts there. Special shout out to all of my current patrons, thank you for your continued support. I am working on one more new character and a few Tasha updates for older characters. Yes, I will be addressing these troublesome changes in some of those videos as well, so stay tuned for more. With everything said and done, MinMax Munchkin out, talk to you soon.